Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. Our guest today is Stéphane Lacroix. He's a professor at Sciences Po in Paris and an authority on political Islam. He previously wrote the book Awakening Islam, the Politics of Religious Dissent in Contemporary Saudi Arabia. And he's now working on Egypt and the political transition there, having just come back a few weeks ago from doing field work in Egypt. So uh, very pleased to have you here. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the general said that they were going to hand over power at the end of June. Has that happened in any meaningful way? It has to some extent. Uh, there is a president who was elected and a lot of people believed at some point that the result of the elections would be changed to have the other candidate who was much closer to the army elected. So in the end, that's the first time in Egypt when there's a president who's not a military person. He's, he's a civilian, he's not. So that, that, that is a form of change. Uh, at the same time, the military made sure that he wouldn't have that much power. And in the run-up to the, to the, to the uh, second round and to the announcement of the results, a number of measures were taken to limit the powers of the elected president. Uh, especially there was a constitutional declaration made by the, by, by the generals, which basically removes out of the, of the hands of the president a lot of his prerogatives. This is the constitutional annex. Isn't this is it? the constitutional annex, exactly. Right. So are they actually more powerful than, than he is? Is it easy to make it or is it not as black and white as that? Well, he has a form and he's been using this for the, for, I mean, since he, his uh, victory was announced, he has some form of moral authority. Uh, you know, he's, he's the president elected by the people. Uh, when it comes to what he can do concretely on the ground, it is, you know, debatable whether he can do much, but at least he can talk. And he can talk from the position of someone who got the people's votes. Uh, of course, again, his powers are very limited. For instance, there was a parliament that has officially now been dissolved. So now the legislative power is in the hands of the army again. So he has a limited executive power and he's lost control over the legislative power. So again, you know, that limits what he can do, but still, you know, again, he has a voice and he's using it to try to, you know, uh, bring something a bit different in the debate than just the army's voice. Um, you've argued how uh, Egypt now faces a situation fundamentally which goes back to 1954, that is this standoff between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army. Um, it's a rather sad outcome after all the bloodshed and sacrifice and the movement in Takriya Square that a third force didn't seem to really emerge. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I mean, in the end, you know, winning elections is about being able to mobilize voters. It's about having networks. It's about, you know, having a presence. And of course, those two poles of power, those two forces, right? The ones that supported Morsi, which are the Muslim Brotherhood and its networks on the one hand, and the forces that supported Ahmed Shafiq, the, you know, the army candidate, quote unquote, was relying very much also on the networks of the former uh, Mubarak party, the, the National Democratic Party. Those two were the most organized ones. So in the end, when it came to mobilizing voters, they were the ones who were the most successful. So in the end, in the second round, we saw the game going back to those two. Uh, there is some hope in the end. Uh, one would say uh, the, the, the other candidates, the one that represented an alternative, uh, they weren't that far in the first round, right? Uh, Morsi got 24%, Shafiq got 23 and the other two candidates who were you know, kind of the revolutionary camp. One was closer to the Islamists in a way, but he was a, you know, centrist Islamist. The other one was a leftist Nasirian. They got 20% and 17%. So a lot of people say, well, had they been together, and at some point they talked about, you know, running together in the elections, they probably would have gone first. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, we're going back to the basics, to the old rules of the game, to the two forces that Egypt has known for so many decades. But people say, well, but you know, the revolutionaries have still you know, been able to manage to get, to prove that they exist on the, on, 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 the, on the political sphere. And if they can translate this into a political party now, for instance, to try to organize, uh, just do what the others did, that is to create those networks that in the end are essential to win. So you think that joint ticket is still a possibility somewhere further down the line? Uh, or at least the forces representing those two men? Right, exactly. The problem is between those two men in the end, you know, there's also personal rivalry. The, the two of them are, you know, leaders, right? So also, you know, in the end, 
someone bringing together those two uh, charismatic leaders, it's always very difficult. Uh, there was also a split between them, which, which, which reflects some of the debates in Egypt over the last few months, which is the split on the role of religion in politics. Uh, Abdel Munim Abul Futuh was this kind of centrist Islamist. Of course, was not completely hostile to the Islamic reference, and you know, he was he comes from there. The other one took a much more liberal, uh, a, you know, civil stance. So of course, this was difficult to unite those two forces because they disagreed on something that is seen as fundamental for uh, the future of Egypt. So again, it's difficult to see whether they can they can bridge the gap between them if they can unite or if they will try to create something different. I want to go back for a second, Stefan, to the balance of power. You did touch on how Morsi had lost legislative power mm. and effectively much executive power as well. Um, do you see this deep state being entrenched now for a very long time? I'm asking because some people have drawn parallels with Turkey mm -hmm. after the 1981 coup, when the army made sure that it wouldn't lose power, it stayed on to write a constitution, and the result was 20 years of coups and counter coups in Turkey, of continuing instability, because the army continued to be so central. Uh, do you think that's going to be the situation in Egypt? I think there's going to be, I mean, the, the, the fight is going on between those two forces, the, the, the Brotherhood on the one hand and the army. Both of them have cards to play in their game, right? Now the Brotherhood, at least, you know, nominally they have the presidency. The army continues, you know, in, you know uh, under the table, right, to, to have a lot of power that it can use. It can also use the judiciary, as we've seen, right? A lot of those decisions that were taken before the elections were went through the judiciary, the Constitutional Court, for instance, which implemented some of the decisions that a lot of people believe were taken by the army. So, you know, the game is going to continue. Uh, the question is now, uh, what will happen to the other forces? How the Brotherhood also will, will act in this new period? What we've seen since Morsi was elected is that he's made a lot of promises to the other forces, that he's not going to be only a Muslim Brotherhood president, that he is going to create coalition government to bring into the government representative of other political forces, that he's not going to be just a representative of the Brotherhood. We're going to see if he does it effectively. For the well, moment, there's no government appointed, so we don't know if the promises are just words. Well, based on his behavior so far, or how the Brotherhood behaved in Parliament, before it was dissolved, what are your, what's your reading based on, the, on past behavior? A lot of people are quite pessimistic. The, the Brotherhood have, I mean, over the last year, they've really, you know, played their own game. Uh, they've all defended their interests as a party, another Brotherhood. Everyone, every time they could, they actually preferred to make a deal with the army than support the revolutionary forces. So a lot of people now worry that actually what we're gonna have maybe is, you know, confrontation between the army and the brotherhood, but also in a way, some form of, you know, implicit agreement between the two to keep all the others out. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really a defining moment and we're gonna see in the next few weeks how Morsi behaves. Uh, one way to get away from that binary sort of this, th this, this polarization that you've mentioned is perhaps for a current within the Muslim Brotherhood to come forward and say, you know, we should be more uh, open or make alliances with other people, not just with the army. And you mentioned the so-called liberal wing mm. of the Brotherhood. Um, does that have any influence or is this just something that the West hopes uh, might happen? Well, this one of the reasons why some people are pessimistic, because there was a liberal wing in the Brotherhood. But what happened after the revolution is that all those liberal brothers actually left the Brotherhood. Uh, Abdel Munim Abul Futuh was this, this candidate who lost the first round and who united behind him one, part of the revolutionary camp. He was a former Brotherhood leader, and he left to try to establish something different. So what we have today is a Brotherhood where most of the liberals have left. And so what remains is the conservatives. And Mohammed Morsi is known to be a staunch conservative. I mean, judging from what he did in the past, and judging from the people he's close to in the Brotherhood. So what we have is a Brotherhood that's probably today more conservative than ever, which is why some people believe that those promises may just be, you know, uh, words that Morsi is using at this moment because the Brotherhood needs those words. But how is it going to translate into actions? Do you think that conservatism then justifies fears in, in the West and, of course, among liberals in Egypt that individual rights might not be protected, that, for example, people who've been thrown into jail through military tribunals, even since this Tahrir Square revolution, mm -hmm. that's not going to be a priority, perhaps, for Morsi. A lot of people fear that. Uh, I was watching today uh, the, the, the news in Egypt, and the revolutionary forces now are confronting Morsi with that demand. 
Right, now you're the president. Prove that you are a real revolutionary. Morsi, during the campaign, said he was a revolutionary. If he is a revolutionary, then let him free all those people who are being held now uh, and being judged in military tr uh, tribunals, right? Under military trials. If he sh gives that, uh, if he makes that step, a lot of the revolutionary will believe that maybe in the end he can be responsive to some of their demands. But he has, again, a, you know, he's given words for the moment. A lot of people expect actions to see whether he can be something different than the old Muslim Brotherhood style that a lot of people fear. Okay, we'll have to end it there because we've now run out of time. But thank you very much for, for your time, Stéphane Lacroix, uh, professor at Sciences Po in Paris and the author of Awakening Islam, The Politics of Religious Dissent in Contemporary Saudi Arabia, of course now focusing on the situation in Egypt. And that's all for the France 24 interview. Thanks for watching.